Okay, welcome ladies and gentlemen uh, to our floor, the Love of Teaching panel. We're just waiting for folks to come in, so enjoy the lovely tunes, and we'll start soon, but welcome uh, one and all. Once again, welcome for all who are joining. We're just going to give a couple of minutes for folks who are coming from their last meeting to this one. Excited to have you, and then we will start shortly. Once again, uh, good afternoon, everyone. We're happy to have you. We're just waiting for folks to come in, so we will start in a minute, but happy that you are here. And I was almost gonna say happy Thursday, but it's only Wednesday, so happy Wednesday. What day of the week is it? Which gives you a sense of how my week is going. But happy Wednesday. Happy Wednesday. All right, I think we are set uh, to begin. Uh, I once again want to say happy Wednesday, uh, one and all. Uh, my name is Ryan Smith, and I serve as the Chief External Officer for the Partnership for Los Angeles Schools, um, as well as uh, currently uh, the interim CEO of the organization. And we are really excited, delighted to have you participate in our first discussion of our Love Letter LA series um, for the love of teaching educators leading the, uh, with compassion and perseverance during the pandemic. And um, before I talk a little bit more about what we're going to do today, can we all just take a moment, and whether it's in the chat or it's in your seat, 
can we just give a little bit of applause to the amazing educators, our classified staff members, our folks who surround our students and our students who have really persevered in a very trying time, not only in history, not only for education, but period. So everyone, just a round of applause for all the wonderful educators who are joining us, the wonderful educators within the partnership network, the wonderful educators across LAUSD, um, across our country as well. We're delighted to have you. Um, so today we're gonna talk a little bit about this moment and what this means for education. For us as a partnership and a nonprofit organization that is an in-district partner to LA Unified and has the privilege of supporting 19 uh, dynamic schools in Watts, Boyle Heights and South LA for um, the past 13 years, we know that folks have done everything possible to ensure that this moment um, is met um, for our students, our families, and our communities. Um, one of my favorite quotes is by Cornell West, and he says that justice is what love looks like in public. And I feel like um, that is an apt saying when we think about both love and justice, um, and many of our educators are doing the hard work on the front lines. So thank you again, and we're excited to have you, and we're gonna start um, our panel. A couple things that you should know about housekeeping that I think is gonna be really important. One, um, who's with us in the webinar? We, we really are going to take a audience poll um, that Claire is launching now about who do we have in the webinar. So pick the role that best describes you. You should have that in your screen now. If you could just do that, that'd be great. And uh, we're gonna review the results in two minutes. The other piece is just the exit ticket. We think it's gonna be really important. We wanna to continue to have these types of events. And we think of this as a learning opportunity for us as this is our first session in Love Letter LA. So at the end of today's webinar, we will share a link in the chat box to an exit ticket. Please make sure to fill uh, this out and give us valuable feedback that will help us in the future as well. And then you have the Q&A feature that you should see um, within your, uh, you know, next to the chat um, in your Zoom application. We will have a limited time at the end of the audience Q&A. So please submit questions you have for our panelists via the Q&A box. And when you ask a question, please include your name, organization, where you're joining us from so we know who you are. Uh, and let's keep the chat box lit. So I think of this as a discussion, both the discussion that you're gonna hear from the dynamic educators who are leading this panel, um, as well as discussion that takes place in the chat. So I like a lit chat room. So if you have comments, if you wanna share resources, if you have things that you think um, panelists should uplift, please put that in um, the chat box and we will continue to refer to that as a group. By the way, we have a couple of hashtags for you. So we invite you to interact on all your social media platforms. So Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. And if you can hashtag um, Partnership LA, hashtag For the Love of Teaching, um, and also tag the amazing educators on the panel, that would be great as well. I've told you a little bit about the partnership. Um, we started in two, 2007. Um, we're a nonprofit that's worked with LAUSD for 13 years to support historically under-resourced traditional public schools. We are not a charter management organization. We really are an in-district service provider supporting traditional public schools. Our goal is systemic change. And as we think about uh, yesterday, marking the anniversary of uh, George, George Floyd's death, I know many of us um, are thinking about injustice and how we can make sure that um, we recognize the humanity in all folks. And we think about our work as um, important to build systems that empower students, educators, and families um, to thrive. Um, so that's a part of our work as well. Um, we adhere to all collective bargaining agreements and operate under the same conditions as um, our district schools. So lastly, I'm just gonna say Love Letter LA is a series of conversations that we're gonna host over the next couple of months. 
I'm including a lot of LA's communities and uh, community leaders and stakeholders about as we go to the next phase of this pandemic in the wake of the pandemic, how do we rebuild in the spirit of love? Um, how do we grapple with loss um, in the spirit of togetherness? And how do we move forward um, in the spirit of making sure we are building and supporting um, our students and families authentically? So we're happy to start this conversation um, with teachers, particularly in the month in which we actually celebrate Teachers Appreciation Week. Um, and we're excited to start this conversation with you as well. And with that, you know, I've talked about in educators, folks who are amazing, folks who have worked in the classroom, worked in schools, and care about um, the historically under-resourced communities that we serve. And I just want to shout out and pass the mic to my very own colleague, um, Marjorie, who is going to moderate this panel and she's fantastic. So without further ado, Marjorie to the, uh, to the stage. Hi, thank you, Ryan. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Ryan has stated, uh, you, all of the participants are in for a special treat this afternoon. You'll be hearing from five amazing practitioners five amazing practitioners. Um, I'm going to just give you, give them, give you some brief introductions, and then you will be hearing specifically from them about what they're currently doing, where they're currently teaching. But we have with us this afternoon, uh, Joanna Mishpe Lee, um, and she was named a Sal Castro Award winner uh, this year by the Los Angeles uh, Unified Board District 2. And she won a Courageous Teacher Award from the Partnership for Los Angeles Schools. Uh, we also have with us Jessica Miller. Um, and Jessica Miller, um, in her first year uh, of 2020, she was identified by LA Unified as a Rookie of the Year. Uh, we have San Juanita Nellum. And uh, this year, she won a Courageous Teacher Award from the Partnership of for Los Angeles schools. Uh, we have uh, Felix Quiones. Um, he is a 2020 LAUSD Teacher of the Year, a two-time National Board Certified Teacher and a holder of both a multiple and single subject teaching credential. And then Jillian Russum, um, she was named uh, in 2020 um, an LA Unified Teacher of the Year. And so we are so excited uh, to have all of the panelists uh, with us this afternoon. And I want to just officially welcome you all. And we're just gonna kick off this session um, by asking you to introduce yourself um, and then tell us in one or two words, what kept you going during the toughest times over the past year? And I'm going to start with uh, Mishba. Hi, thank you so much, Marjorie. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Joanna Mishvele. Uh, I am a Chicana Huichol from Boyle Heights, born and raised. And um, I've been an educator for over 15 years, I believe. I lost count at some point, but it's, um, it's just been great to be able to be within the community and work with the community, right? And uh, something that's definitely helped along these years has, especially this past year, it feels like years to many of us, uh, has been just to give myself grace, you know, and give and give others grace as well, because uh, we're just simply surviving a pandemic, right, and doing the best that we can. And so that's been really helpful. Thank you. Jessica. Hello, everyone. I'm Jessica Miller. I teach fifth grade in South LA at Flournoy Elementary Steam and Magnet. Uh, the word I think that reflects this year the most for me is the word resilience not only by students, but by all of us as well, making it through this year. So I'm really excited to be here and share and learn from everybody. I'm gonna throw it to you, Nita. Hello, everybody. My name is San Juanita, as known as Nita Nellum. Um, I'm a special education math teacher at Carver Middle School, which is actually part of the partnership network. Um, one thing that kept me going during this past year is my daughter. Um, she's two right now, so she often wanted to be part of the Zoom sessions, you know, when we're doing distance learning. 
she was always Zoom bombing and making it difficult to really stay focused when teaching a lesson. But even though this year has been challenging and stressful at times, I had the opportunity to spend more time with my daughter. So um, being able to connect more with my daughter over this past year because I was home has de definitely kept me going during this, uh, this challenging time. Thank you. Felix? First of all, I'm excited to be here and excited to share with all of you. My name is Felix Quinones. I've been teaching for 23 years, 17 years as a multiple subject uh, elementary teacher and six years as a single subject physical education teacher. I also mentor other elementary teachers uh, on how to teach physical literacy using standards-based instruction. My two words would be uh, remained connected. Jillian. Hi everyone, uh, Jillian Russum, uh, she, her pronouns. This is my 20th year teaching at Roosevelt and previously its satellite campus. Um, I teach history, uh, world and US history. And I guess two things that have kept me going gonna be solidarity and gardening. Good to be here. So welcome to all once again. And so I just want to officially uh, kick us off, uh, Jessica, by asking, what has it been like to try to meet uh, your students' needs over the past year? Um, how have you balanced supporting students' social emotional needs and academic needs? It has been very challenging to say the least. I think especially in the beginning of all of this, um, remembering how important it is for students to have interactions with each other and that Zoom often didn't account for friends and other classes and situations like that. So uh, one way I met those needs was my grade level, we decided to host what we named a fun Friday so we would bring all the fifth graders together in one Zoom, and then we would have different activities and different breakout rooms, which would be monitored by the different teachers. So it ranged anywhere from a Kahoot, from a draw along. Some students just wanted a room where they could chat to each other. And students really looked forward to that Friday. It got us motivated for the rest of the week during this challenging time. And it reminded all of us how important uh, those social connections are for sustaining us through this time where we were experiencing a lot of isolation. Thank you. Uh, Felix? You're on mute, Felix. Sorry, here I am. For me, it was a privilege and at the same time, a positive challenge. What I mean by privilege is because of my partnership with the families and my colleagues. Uh, being able to collaborate in a moment that was unprecedented, and it still is, uh, is, is a privilege to be able to be in a role to influence students and to be there for them. Um, for me, it's also a positive challenge because it caused me to reevaluate my personal life to make sure that I put uh, self-care at a higher priority than it was before so that I don't uh, feel the effects of compassion fatigue. <laughs> and the ways that I balanced uh, the social emotional uh, skills or needs of my students were in several ways. Uh, one was I increased the trauma sensitive practices, like making sure that it was just part of the culture of learning to, to identify feelings, to be able to talk about the stories behind the feelings, and then to also have platforms to either share if the students choose to, but for that to just be what we do and to do that several times in a day and to be able to just have that support. Another way was just integrating more of the performing arts with the SEL needs. Uh, with LUSD, the focus is growth mindset, self-efficacy, self-management, self and social awareness. So I started writing songs. So I wrote a song called Growth Mindset. Kind of goes like this. Growth mindset is what I say. I can get better each and every day, right? So kind of just throwing it out there, making it the theme making it part of just a positive learning environment. And at the same time using that, when I would give challenging content to the students and they would start to feel like they're going into a fixed mindset, I would say, okay, let's go, by, let's go back to that song again. Um, another way was also increasing the application of physical education standards. 
with the SEL standards. Um, and one of the ways, if you were to walk in the classroom, you would see a lot of mind body types of exercises, the physical education standard emphasizing flexibility in this case, the SEL content would be focusing on self-management and utilizing brain research on how mind body exercises helps reduce anxiety. So I would be uh, addressing those needs in that way. How I address the academic needs of my students was by increasing student choice using universal design of learning. I would also increase the, um, the interaction between uh, my students and student-friendly sort of rubrics. So they would take more ownership to the learning and I would be able to give them more personalized feedback. I also would use Zoom to differentiate and give different uh, feedback and different pathways of learning for the students. And I would also use the Nearpod to gamify learning, to get an idea of where my students are at and to also give them feedback. Thank you. Thank you, Felix. Uh, Mish Bay, how did you balance the two? So uh, for myself, you know, something, since I teach, I, I realized I didn't even say where I was from. I'm a ninth grade English teacher at MSU Mace. I'm sorry, I got distracted by my daughter who came in. Uh, but, um, you know, as a teacher to ninth graders who never even stepped on campus, right, in their very first year of high school, um, it would, you know, something that's always important is just creating a safe learning environment where you, where you can hold space for one another, you know, and, um, you know, as we all know, all of our students, you know, went through so many different types of experiences. And there was one in particular where students were giving a presentation and one of them stopped. And I just overheard him in Spanish say to a, what sounded like a younger sibling, you know, I'm ahorita te voy a dar de comer, papa, which means like, I'm going to give you something to eat. And that just, uh, you know, it just made me happy and made me want to cry and just it pushed all the emotions out. And then he actually apologized to everyone else, you know, to, uh, for for having that it's uh, quote unquote interruption, right? And um, and the thing that was beautiful is that because we have been instituting things like uh, Mindful Monday in our department where the students actually brainstormed and came up with a list of different self-care and just different types of activities that they wanted to do on Monday since we had a shorter day. Uh, and then we you know did those on Mondays and because we also did daily self-care activities, um, the students, instead of, you know, they actually all chimed in and they, they commended him for doing what he did, you know, and and um, and they held that space for him, and so it was, uh, so you know those things have been just as equally as important in this academic achievement. So what I'm hearing, especially when I hear things like Fun Friday, um, incorporating self care, um, addressing students' uh, SEL needs, um, a mindful Monday. Uh, those things can't be um, successful in isolation. So what I'd love to hear, especially to start out from you, Nita, uh, what support from your school did you find essential while teaching remotely? Um, and especially like when you think about connecting and collaborating with your colleagues over the past year, uh, what, are the, what were the practices that worked especially well and you know, let me know, do you think you'll keep collaborating virtually over the long term? Okay, thank you. Um, so when I think about the things that worked for me over the past year, the support from my math coach, the support from my math department as a whole, and even from my special education department as well, were super essential to uh, while teaching remotely and even as a, we transition to hybrid learning. So as far as my math coach, she provided support and guidance when it came to my lesson planning, when it came to lesson plan feedback, observations, um, encouraging me and our other colleagues to, to observe each other. And then even she, she came in and observed me and um, you know we had discussions about that. Um, she helped me set, set and track the goals that I, I wanted to focus on throughout the year. She even encouraged me to take on a leadership role next year as a team leader. Like I've never seen myself, you know, even doing this, right? <laughs> Speaking in front of a, a whole crowd of you and just taking on any kind of leadership role. Like I really flourished over this year. Um, and she's really helped me with that. And then as a math department, um, we do our own little SEL check-ins. And so um, before we dive in into our data analysis discussions. And so in the past, before the pandemic, we did check-ins. We did stuff like, um, oh, would you rather do this or that? Or, um, you know, what's your plans for the weekend? Or how are you feeling on a scale of one to 10? But this past year, 
our check-ins have been more personal and like more interconnected or intimate um, to where I believe because of those um, activities that we've been done, that we have been doing in the, uh, in the department, we have bonded more from a distance more than ever, you know, than, than we were in person. Um, even with new colleagues this year as well. Um, seeing them in person is like, oh, I know who you are, even though I've never seen you until like four weeks ago. <laughs> um, so for example, Last month, we had to complete this activity about our, and our, our uh, sorry guys, <laughs> I'm nervous, um, about our identity. And so we had to create this one slide presentation on Google about our experiences growing up that shaped our mathematical identity and what values uh, shape us today as well. And so it was very heartfelt, like when everybody had a chance to share, you know, how you know how their math teachers were when they were growing up or how their cultural beliefs shape what they uh believe in today like it was like we ha we had some tears <laughs> so but i think because of those situations um our connection has enabled us to be more comfortable with sharing ideas taking risks and asking uncomfortable questions and doing what it takes to support our students emotional and mathematical needs uh, and so the last question you said is do you think um, we're going to keep collaborating virtually. I really hope not, because I think we can bring these practices in person. Um, but I mean, if we need to, then that's okay, because I know that we have that connection virtually or in person, right? So I'm okay with either way. Thank you. Jillian? That was awesome. And I, just what Nita shared reminded me how, like, when we talk about building restorative practices and you know, socio-emotional learning with our young people, like it really has to start with us as adults as well. Like if we're not building those relationships with each other, then how can we be like a community of support to our young people? So that was really, that was a great point. Um, I just wanted to share in terms of support, like I just wanted to like, when I re reflect back to the start of the pandemic, um, just reminding folks like for myself that's been around a little bit longer 20 years like it was such a difficult learning curve at the beginning of this pandemic I mean. Um, transitioning from reading and annotating on paper together um, to everything having to be on a screen and in a, in a format that would make sense to students on a computer um, and creating slides for every class for every day I mean it was. It was really, really hard. Um, and I just wanted to say that I, I know at the beginning, some of us were receiving like these big long lists of resources, which was like a little bit overwhelming, not that helpful. <laughs> um, and so I just wanted to say that like every teacher's needs might be different and one-on-one -on -one support was really key. Um, some of the newer teachers at Roosevelt uh, like my colleague, Danielle Gulante, shout out Danielle, we're like giving workshops on some technology stuff to other, other folks on how to integrate um, the Google suite and everything that was super helpful. Um, and then I just wanted to share about a, a professional development that we put together um, as teachers on compassionate and equitable grading practices that I think was really, uh, really positive and supportive for a lot of us because we started with students and we had a panel of students just share what they have been experiencing during this pandemic, whether it was you know, grief and loss or constant connectivity issues or depression, loss of motivation, you know, not having a space to concentrate or you know, economic challenges in their family, having to work to support. Um, and it just framed for all the educators who were like, these kids aren't showing up, you know, what's going on? Like, why aren't they participating at the level we might have wanted? It just really reminded all of us what, what's going on. Um, and so teachers were able to share some of how we've shifted the way that we grade and the way that we assess, whether it's, you know, giving less homework, um, giving more time, you know, incorporating joy and fun into the class as much as possible. Um, and changing, you know, not giving zeros, not failing young people in a pandemic. Um, and so um, as far as moving forward, I think this, there were a lot of teachers who were, were like, wow, you know, I knew what our kids were going through, but I didn't really know. And 
So, you know, we've talked about how can we have students at our professional developments more often, like students sharing how things feel to them, um, and also just different teachers sharing how they're trying to adjust. Thanks. Thank you. I just want to acknowledge that that really resonates for me going from a home, going from an office space to a home office space, even just like the act of checking email, like, or how do I do this thing now in this new environment where I wasn't used to doing it in the context. Um, so that resonates. And the tools, a lot of it was technology. And at first it didn't feel like it was helping, you know, and I don't know if that was the experience of the panel, but the technology and at first it just didn't feel like it was helping or making things any easier. Um, and then also just the acknowledgement that, you know, we are in a, a pandemic and these are unprecedented, you know, times that we have to acknowledge that. So thank you. Um, for that. And then I want to ask, is there an instructional practice? And I'm going to ask this of uh, Mishpe. Is there an instructional practice or routine you've been doing differently in the past year that you plan to retain after students are all back in person? Well, I know for myself, I totally echo what Jillian just shared, right, about um, for me, humanizing grading was just it, you know, it was so, so essential this year because for all the reasons that you stated. So I also, you know, got rid of the zeros. I mean, it really made me step back, right? And think like, what is it that I'm actually giving assigning students and, and how is it really, you know, allowing them to show growth, right? And so with that, um, you know, I took away not penalizing students for turning in late work because, um, you know, at the end of the day, like, I don't even understand like what, pedagogy justifies that, right? Because all students learn at different, you know, differently, period, period, right? Even we all learn differently, look at us and trying to adapt to all this technology, right? There's still so much I don't even know. And so, um, so I really, um, you know, have, I accept any type of late work, you know, and also too, I think um, um, something that was really big was continuing to give students that agency by allowing them to have different choices and to even create the choices and how they can demonstrate that that um, that growth, right? And so something that was a lot of fun this year that did institute and use uh, technology was creating podcasts. And that was just great because they were able to collaborate and do podcasts together and they were able to send it to some to the people they were interviewing and they interviewed people in the community. And so um, it was something that really was an enriching experience um, because you know, gave them that agency. They also had that ability to connect with people in the community, although we couldn't leave our homes, right? And um, and it also personalized it to them and made it very, very relevant. And so um, those are some of the things that I really look forward to, to continuing in the upcoming years. Oh, I like the idea of podcasts. I love that. Um, Nita, how about, how about you for your students? Um, overall, I definitely want to continue to incorporate um, technology, right? Um, working with students with special needs can be very difficult, you know, because they have a lot of learning gaps and different ways that they're learning, right? So one thing that we used this year was a program called Desmos. Um, it's an online learning program or, or platform or tool where you can use or create lessons that students can engage with. So um, I was really able to like personalize my lessons so I can support my students' needs, right? Some students needed embedded support such as sentence frames, that was there. Um, visual aids, I found really cool Google images or I learned how to create different um, charts about you know, equations, expressions, um, I don't know, <laughs> uh, you know, and then put it on there. Uh, they had a calculator on there. And so they were able to use that. Um, options to show their thinking, they can sketch their work, they can draw images, they can um, upload images, they can, uh, what else? There were just so many different things they can do to show their thinking. Um, and they didn't have to stick to one thing. Um, and then I was able to provide them word banks and chunk the tasks. So instead of seeing three questions about the same task, I can just show them one question at a time, right? Um, so that was, I think that benefited my kids a lot and I want to continue using that program. Um, another thing that we did as a department is the SEL check-ins. Um, before they even dived into the warm-up, we 
check to see how they were feeling, you know, just to recognize how they're feeling, share with each other, connect with each other, and overall just do some, do a quick activity to get ready for the lesson. Um, another thing I wanna do is the Jamboard activities. Um, same like Desmos, where you can just really tweak it to your likings and the kids love it. Um, and then it's just another way for the kids to collaborate with each other. And then another thing I did uh, was reflections. Back in school, you know, I, I taught the lesson, did the cool down or the exit ticket and then that was it. So now I've been um, having students reflect on their learning. So instead of just doing the exit ticket and, you know, going to our next class, how well do you think you met the learning target? You know, do you think you still need some support? What do you think you need to do? You know, um, stuff like that. Uh, and then also something else I did was mastery learning grading. Uh, just, yeah, getting rid of the zero. Um, not really focusing on the number of assignments they completed, but you know what, if you did seven out of 10 and you got a three or four out of most of those, then you're gonna get a three or four for meeting that learning target, you know what I mean? So um, those are the things that I've done uh, this past year that I continue to do next school year. Thank you. So I think what I'm hearing, especially the, from the comments that Jillian made before and then Mishpay and now you Nita, I think this will this will dovetail neatly into the next question. Um, and what we're hearing in the news or in the media about learning loss uh, from this past year of distance learning. So uh, what does that phrase mean to you? And as I said, I wanna start with you, Jillian, what does that phrase mean to you? And what do you want people to know about what students lost um, and what they gained during this time? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if y'all saw um, the tweet from Dr. Goldie Muhammad about learning loss. Um, she, she said, learning loss presumes that students were only at a loss during a pandemic. Yet children and uniquely black children have been at an educational loss, including loss of identity and joy since the inception of this country being colonized. Can you lose something that systematically schools never gave you? Definitely uh, makes you stop and reflect. And, and I think, you know, we all talk about the problems with deficit thinking, right? Like to me, the, the focus on learning loss implies that only when students are in our presence in school, that's the only place that intelligence comes from and not from their family or their community. Um, and so there's, you know, a real racial bias there too, I think. Um, and, uh, you know, also it's just, I think it denigrates some of what you've heard on this panel of, of some of the incredible learning experiences that have been created, you know, throughout this year. Um, um, you know, I think, like, I think, you know, we have and our students have lost things this year, but most importantly, you know, some have lost family members, you know, um, they've lost social connections to friends and, um, you know, hugs and socio emotional support and some of those connections that like I teach teenagers, you know, it's, it's, it's so important. And so, um, you know, I think it's made people realize that schools can, if we do our work right, can be such an important place of, you know, social and emotional support. Um, but I think why this is important to get this right is because it determines what are we going to focus on when we return, right? Are we going to focus on cramming in, you know, more instructional time, more instructional days, more standards? You know, I, I'm very glad we're not adding 10 instructional days for our students, right? Because that isn't that, you know, that isn't what's key in terms of what they've lost. What we need to focus on rebuilding is, you know, their confidence and their friendships and their community and, and that type of thing. So I, I think that is important um, in terms of how we look at what's happened for them this year. Thank you. Thank you. Jessica, love to hear your thoughts. Yes, um, I think in the term learning loss, students will only lose what we make them feel like they've lost out on. So personally, in um, my community that I teach in, it's not really any different than any other year where you have different students 
at different places. Some of them are well below the standards, some of them are below, some of them are at grade level, and no matter what, I as your teacher am responsible for meeting you where you're at and helping you grow throughout that year. So I just see that as my regular responsibility and I think uh, learning losses is imagining that education is already equitable as it is, which we all here know is not true. So I think that's kind of just covering up and putting a blanket statement on a much larger issue that we're all uh, working on addressing and fighting. Thank you, Felix, I'd love to hear your thoughts as well. Well, uh, for me, the phrase, uh, a lot of thoughts come to mind, but there are many factors that contribute to learning loss. Uh, pandemic would be one of them, right? So when students have low blood flow because they're moving at a minimal level, then that's gonna increase anxiety. When students are eating nine times the amount of sugar that the USDA recommends, and that's gonna create inflammation in the brain, inflammation in the body. It's also gonna promote mood swings. When students are socially isolated, like Jillian shared, then that's going to increase depression. You know, when students are experiencing loss because someone died due to COVID-19, I think all of us agree that under those conditions, uh, it's going to be tough to concentrate and learn when you're grieving. Um, so for me, what I've understood for many years is that my students understand grit. It's, it's what they've learned in life. What they need from me is to be a partner with them in life and to be able to be resilient with them, to go through the process of doing life together and for me to play my role as best as I can. Thus, the need for me to take care of myself so I can be of better service to the students. But in the flip side of that, then of course, there were learning gains. So I wish to highlight that now. One of the obvious ones was an increase of uh, technology and literacy from basic operations and functions to now they're at multiple platforms and able to move within those channels. And I'm super encouraged to see that. And they're very happy, I think. <laughs> Remember, I teach the little ones, right? From K to six. So this is right inside their culture because they're digital natives. Another thing is they grew in their digital citizenship. So they have an understanding of footprint and understanding what it means what are the benefits and what are the costs that you need to factor in when you're on cyber world? Uh, they also learn to, um, you know, grow in their independence as learners and also in their management of time. I'll give you another example. They also grew in their expression of learning. So I integrated physical education standards, specifically rhythmic skills with computer science standards. And that was a lesson where they had, they had to learn to either mimic, design, redesign, or create uh, dance routines. So after they've done that, either in a solo or a pair or a group setting, and of course we would use Zoom and go into breakout rooms, they would then send me information through Flipgrid just to show me what's their progress and they would use the rubric to monitor their progress. Well, after they were successful with that, then they would transition to the computer science standard, which is for them to learn how to code. And then they would just code dance routines using Dance Party from code.org, Dance Party 2019. <laughs> Um, and then they would create these uh, coded dances. And then the final product was student created products. Then the audience would then select an animation. Then they would mimic the movement as the students are presenting their work. And lo and behold, now we have student created brain breaks, which we would then use throughout the rest of the year. So it was awesome to just see them uh, integrate um, the different content and to have uh, and to thrive. They were able to do that physically by designing it and then able to transfer that to coding. So those are some gains. And then there's, of course, a lot more, but those are a few of them. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you all for that. Um, and so we do have time for one more question. Um, and Julian, I'm going to throw it back to you. Um, as students return to campus this spring and next fall, um, how do you think schools can rebuild student culture and the sense of community and inclusion we want them to feel? Um, I'll try to be brief. I think this is huge for us, right? I mean, I think that there's a number of mandates at this moment about what we can create for young people. Um, I think post pandemic, I think we have a mandate around mental health as a priority in our schools, right? And this has also been the year of 
the movement for black lives reaching a whole new level and audience. And so I think the mandate for racial justice is also really, really uh, collectively on us right now. Um, and then, you know, when we think about how can we, uh, what can we do in our schools, um, folks probably know that we are looking at getting somewhere between two and five billion additional dollars to our school district, um, which has a total budget of $7 billion. So student, like the funding for student needs could almost double with this, um, this funding. And so I think, you know, we have this chance to be really transformative um, in what school culture looks like um, and the opportunities for students. Um, just really quick, um, you know, community coalition called Reclaim Our Schools LA has put together, you know, a platform for um, racially just and healing return um, with things like, you know, eliminating school police, um, expanding um, the Black Student Achievement Plan, um, creating these whole child transition teams. So like social workers, counselors, special education supports for young people, um, you know, more community schools and more green space. And then, and that's, a, you know, that's a call on the district as a whole in terms of how to invest this new money. And then at our school sites, we have funding coming to us, right? And at, you know, at my school, we're gonna have the opportunity to add more arts electives, uh, perhaps a folklorico dance class, perhaps a ceramics class, um theater class and we all know that like how much joy is critical to to healing in this return for our young people um and last really quick like how can we reinvigorate our commitment to restorative justice i just want to shout out uh, miss morales our restorative justice teacher at roosevelt who's been so critical to creating that community for our students Thank you. Um, I'm gonna ask you, Felix, if you can respond, but I'm gonna give you 30 seconds. <laughs> no problem, I'll try. So I have a couple of suggestions uh, that we take all the best practices we've learned online and transfer that to in-person, uh, even if it's a hybrid platform. Uh, example, like the self-awareness check-in going from learning, continuing to support. The pandemic might seem like it's going over, but their experience is post-pandemic that we need to be prepared for. So I think continuing to practice like that and actually using the data, not just saying, okay, you're good, okay, fine. But using the data to either increase connection focus experiences if the kids are feeling kind of sad before I move forward with content focused instruction. I have more, but you gave me 30, so I'll stop there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> thank you. So I want to thank all of the panelists. Give yourselves a round of applause. We have reached the Q&A portion of our time together. Um, and so we do have a question. You know, I'm going to throw this to you, um, Nita, and I want to invite um, our participants um, to please, uh, you can please send your questions in. Uh, but I'm going to throw this one to you, Nita, and you'll see why. So please share some practices that have helped you communicate and get positive student development in groups such as students with IEPs or who are experiencing housing instability and foster care. So what forms of communication were most effective and what was your what has your approach been? All right, so when I was looking at that question, the first thing that I thought about was praise, 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 and just always focusing on the student's strengths. So I mean, I definitely had students who had someone pass away in their family due to COVID or not, I'm not sure. I didn't wanna have that conversation if they weren't comfortable. I've had students who didn't show up um, who were definitely dealing with housing instability. Um, so when they were there, I just, praise them for anything that they did thank you for showing up today oh, thank you for logging into that oh guys look who's here oh you know what i mean so <laughs> just always being so that they know that i'm happy that they're there and i want them to be there right regardless of what they do when they're there <laughs> um so i think that encouraged them to come to my class um more often 
And um, as far as the, and then the strengths too, right? Like I have kids who are reading at, you know, I work with middle school. So I have kids who are reading at first first uh, grade level or, you know, don't really have good numbers since. Um, and, and it's okay, you know, I just try to do whatever I, and I'm expected to teach grade level. Like I, I don't teach first grade math. I teach sixth, seventh and eighth grade math. So I just do, I just do whatever I can to uh, get them there, right? Um, and then as far as the communication, um, I have an assistant who speaks Spanish. So she has been very uh, good at communicating with parents who speak, who speak Spanish. Um, we text them, we call them. Um, I use an app sometimes that helps me translate as well. I use Schoology messages, I use email. Um, I can definitely say I've, I've gotten a lot better at communicating with parents this year than last year. I was kind of scared, um, <laughs> but just so, just this past year communicating with parents has really helped me and then my as well. Um, and then what else? Blackboard Connect. I don't know if you guys have that. That has helped as well. And just always focusing on the positives, right? Um, and, and before you let them know what's the real deal. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, and we have mm -hmm. another question. Um, since you mentioned uh, families, and this is open to anyone who'd like to answer, what role have families played this year? And how have you engaged with families? I can take this one, especially as an elementary school teacher. Families are essential to get my fifth graders to do anything. So I think uh, the biggest role was open communication with them. I think to a lot of my families, have had negative school experiences. So it was a really important thing to me that our relationship was a positive one. So I think what Nita was talking about of that praise was also something I tried to open all conversations with as well. Even if I'm reaching out because your student has done nothing, I'm going to give them a compliment first and say something positive about them first because that is how I see them. Um, and the assignments aren't as important as they are as a person. And I know a lot of other things are going on in families' lives as well. So Dojo was the tool that our school uses, which is nice because we post all our updates on there. I can show them what we're doing in class. I can message um, families privately. Um, and a lot of them you know, would message me, oh, do they have homework? So that was a really nice tool um, in that way, but I'm bad and I give my number out to families too so they can text me and such because things change, numbers change, apps get deleted. So I just try to make myself as open as possible. Um, Nishpe? I'm gonna combine both of those questions into one. So I think something that was uh, really awesome this year that we did, especially how, you know, going, because we have, I'm at the high school level, so we have our advisories and um, our, our amazing, you know, educators that work with our IEP students, they, they actually had their own advisory with uh, our IEP students, which was really nice. And I would, as an English teacher, go and pop in and support in that way. And we'd communicate with the family. So we had, you know, a whole like kind of just flow of um, just check and balances kind of happening with the students. And so that was something that was really nice. So then when, you know, it came down to like our virtual um, parent conference night, which was a whole other thing. Uh, it was nice to, you know, to have parents come in, um, have, have them come in and then already, there's already like an established communication and understanding, right? And we're just kind of like continuing and elaborating on that. And so, yeah, the praise is very important. I mean, just them being present, you know, is is so great, you know, because there's so many things that everyone had to face. So, so yeah, parent communication is essential, especially, I mean, I, and we see it less as, you know, the students get older. I think as ninth graders, you see it more than say like a senior, you know, as they get older, but um, but I mean, it's something that's so, so key and so helpful for all of our students. And then Mishpe, I just wanna ask mm. as we uh, start to wrap things up, mm. um, how will you spend your summer? Um, I am gonna spend my summer running and spending time with my daughter. I, I love to run. I'm a founder of a group called Running Mommies and uh, it's a safe space for mothers throughout the whole nation now because of the pandemic. Before it was just um, Boyle Heights East LA based, but now it's everywhere. So we're actually doing a virtual 
a challenge where women are going to be doing a virtual marathon relay race uh, as soon as school gets out. So we're training for that. And literally women are going to be running like in my team, I'm going to run here and then I'm going to text someone and be like, it's your turn. And she's going to be running in Oaxaca. <laughs> so uh, I'm really excited about that. Uh, Jessica, how are you spending your summer? I will be teaching summer school, but when I'm not doing that, I will be at the beach reading a book. <laughs> uh, Felix? I'm gonna definitely get reacquainted with family and friends. We've been isolated for so long, so I'm super excited. And uh, I already have a book summer, just excited. <laughs> Nita? Uh, definitely uh, nothing. No. <laughs> Spending time with my daughter. Um, I want to get into this book that I bought about a month ago that I haven't even touched yet. Um, and just, yeah, get out the house as much as possible. Go to the beach, go to the aquarium, go to Vegas, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> just definitely get out the house as much as possible. Jillian? Props to the moms on this panel, you're amazing. Um, I am gonna take a road trip. I've never been to Washington State or Vancouver. So I'm gonna drive up the coast. I'm excited for that. And the readers, when you get a chance, just drop the titles that you're, you're gonna be reading. Cause I'm a, I, I always have a stack of books. Um, but I wanna thank you all. And now this, I enjoyed hearing from you but I am going to toss it back to uh, Ryan. So thank you very much. Thank you. Everyone, can you give a round of applause for the amazing educators on this panel? Please shout out to Nita and Jessica and Felix and Mishpe and Jillian for really, um, not only just telling it like it is, but really getting to the heart of the matter about how we support students in this moment. If you could do me a favor, um, write one thing you've learned, one thing that resonated with you um, from the panel in the uh, chat box, <laughs> that'd be really helpful. Um, also, can you give a round of applause to Marjorie, our director of talent, who has done every position in, in a school site possible and continues to dedicate her life of service to students and families. We're so appreciative of the way you moderate it and also the way that you love. I'm so happy to call you uh, my colleague in this work. Um, so here's a couple of things that I want um, to, to just lift up from what I heard. First of all, Felix, I think you have a number one hit. I will be singing that song tonight. I appreciate hearing your voice. Um, Nita, you were talking not only about the importance of special education and how you're working with your colleagues, but I love the way you talked about how you're meeting students' emotional and mathematical needs together. I thought that was a beautiful way to talk about how we meet multiple needs of our students. Um, Jillian, you know, I wrote down that social emotional learning starts with adults. And also talking about the needs of this moment, how we can talk about justice, whether we're talking about justice for black lives, we're talking about how we support marginalized students, like that matters and student agency matters too. Speaking of student agency, Mishpe, I loved two things. One, that heart-wrenching story um, that you lifted up when the student took the moment to talk to their family member. I think it showed how our students live intersectional lives, but also, you talked about this amazing podcast work where you are absolutely making space for student agency and we appreciate you for that. And you know, Jessica, thank you for representing for the elementary school teachers in the house. And I love the way that you ended when you said it's important that we are engaging our families in this discussion, particularly at the elementary school level. And we would say at the partnership at all levels, your work is compelling. Now I will say this, we are beginning this conversation with educators and we wanna continue this. So a couple of things that I want to say. One, um, I'm giving a shout out to Margie Weller, um, to Claire Brown, to Carolina Martinez, um, to our wonderful communications team, to Chevelli Solorzano who pulled this together. 
we this is our first time doing this and we want to continue so if you're interested in having more discussions and dialogues with other educators in la make sure that we have your contact information and also reach out to claire brown she's going to put her email in the chat box and if you can just um if you can reach out to her if you want to continue this discussion that'd be great we also have open positions for folks who are interested in looking and working and supporting our schools. And we obviously can give you that information, but we love educators who love students. And we have a sense that you're here for that purpose, which is exciting. The last couple of things that um, are gonna be important for housekeeping. One, um, we hope that you'll learn more about us. So please like and follow the Partnership for LA Schools. Uh, you can look at us for Twitter and I believe on Instagram at Partnership LA. You can also look for our Facebook um, group, Partnership for Los Angeles Schools. Um, we're putting in the exit ticket right now. So please fill that out. That is, we're, we don't charge for these things, but that's the evaluation that helps us continue to keep this going. Um, so please fill that out as well. And lastly, you know, I'm gonna end with um, thinking about love again. Um, as I think about this being API Heritage Month, um, I think about one of my, um, I would say, I want to say mentors <laughs> in the work. Um, I think about Grace Lee Boggs and her legacy on love and activism and justice. And she said that love isn't about what we did yesterday, but it's about what we do today, tomorrow, and the day after. And may we work together today, tomorrow, and the day after to support our students and families. Thank you so much for your time. Please um, take care of yourselves and we'll see you at your next uh, at our next event. Thank you on behalf of the partnership of my colleagues. Appreciate you. And we're signing you off with love and gratitude. Take care until next time. Passing lost, passing lost, passing lost.